Okay, I just want to encourage people to take their seats again so we can get back underway. Um, so welcome back. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce um, our, our next speakers, to introduce Rick Young and David Sabatini, who are two of the Whitehead Institute scientists spearheading the new initiative, Cancer Treating the Untreatable. So let me say just a few words about both Rick and David Sabatini, and then I'll let them take it away. So Rick is an internationally recognized authority on cell circuitry. He's the founder of Ciro's Pharmaceuticals, and he was recognized by Scientific American as among the top 50 leaders in science, technology, and business. His work on the mechanisms uh, that, control, uh, that control genes in living cells has enormous implications for our understanding of cancer and the development of new diagnostics and therapeutics. So we'll be hearing from Rick first, and then uh, we'll be hearing from David Sabatini. David studies the mechanisms that regulate cell growth, and he's been studying a particular growth regulator known as the mechanistic target of rapamycin, or mTOR. So I think David, as he travels the world, is introduced as Mr. Mtor. Has that happened, David? Uh, yeah, yeah, he'll quiet. Anyway, since he, he first identified the pathway as a graduate student, David is the 2014 recipient of the National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology for his groundbreaking discoveries on the mTOR kinase pathway, including the roles of that, path, of that signaling pathway in nutrient sensing, cell physiology, and cancer. So please join me in welcoming Rick and then David. Great. And I think there's a, a real opportunity cost to taking your Friday morning in New York City and electing to come to any one particular place, and especially for many of the very accomplished people who I see in this audience, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And I hope to do two things for you that make uh, this a special opportunity. One is to teach you something about yourself, and the other is to persuade you that in the coming five years that the things that I'm about to tell you will have a measurable impact on uh, cancer, on this, on this scourge. And I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about the challenge we face. And to preface this by reminding you of a few facts. So one fact is you have a genome whose polymer nature, uh, it can be stretched out into two meters. So a single cell has two meters, two yards of DNA compacted into a tiny little space, about five microns. You're about 30 trillion cells. Uh, so 30 trillion times two meters is the amount of DNA polymer you're carrying around in your body. And so what kind of distance is that? That's the diameter of the solar system. So you're carrying a DNA fiber in your body that spans the solar system in its length. And those are the instructions that are being used. That's the blueprint to generate the biological functions that make a living, breathing human being. And it's astonishing to me that things don't go wrong more often than they do. That's an amazing set of instructions, uh, an amazing process of developing from a single fertilized cell to 30 trillion cells. And the fact that it goes right is really pretty amazing. But cancer is one of the major things that goes wrong. 
and 40% of us will develop cancer in our lifetimes, and about half of those of us who develop it will die of it. And that's just unacceptable to me. And if you think about cancer, you can think about it in many different ways. Uh, one way of thinking about it is the number of people who succumb to these cancers. And I have up here some of the most challenging of these cancers. The most challenging of the cancers are the ones that really are very, very difficult to treat, that once we have a diagnosis, give us a less than 50% likelihood of survival in five years. There's some special uh, cancers, especially recalcitrant cancers like pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, triple negative breast cancer, that give us only about a 20% survival over five years. We like to change that. And the idea we have for changing that comes in three pieces. One piece is to better understand the genetics that are go into a cancer cell. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. And another is over there on the right to understand the, the genomic pathways that are used in tumor cells to do their nasty deeds. And it's the combination of these two things that gives us what, uh, say, a pharmacologist would uh, call a target and might, in the pharmaceutical industry, attempt a drug. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we can help that process, having identified targets, we can identify what are called chemical probes, which give the pharmaceutical industry and other academics a, a leg up in the process of trying to find new treatments. So it's this, it's this process I want to describe to you. And to begin with, I'd like to ask my colleague, David Sabatini, to come up here to describe an entirely new, groundbreaking, sensitive, and very rapid approach to profile for any one cancer the exact set of vulnerabilities across the entire genome of that cancer cell. So David, please come up here and explain this to us. Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you all for coming. I know you have many, many other things to do, and hopefully uh, you'll find this interesting and also something that uh, you've learned something for. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story uh, It's going to center around a technology or a method that is shown here. It's called CRISPR. This is actually an, an acronym for something which I won't, uh, I won't spell out. I'll show you some hints of this. And, and I think it's, it's safe to say that this technology is really revolutionizing biology, really all fields of biology, and that when we look back, let's say five, ten years from now, we'll probably see this as an inflection point in our understanding and the use of this tool for understanding biology. And I think cancer is, is almost certainly going to be the disease that's most impacted by this, but not the only one. And so I'll try to give you a flavor for this. I think relatively few times in, in biology something come along that really catches like wildfire and because of its robustness becomes used in everything. And I hope I, hope I can give you a little flavor of this. Now, what I am going to actually show you real data. So if some of you don't understand that, I don't mind if you raise your hand and, and interrupt me and ask me to explain it. But I think Rick and I afterwards will take some questions. But really, feel free to, to interrupt me if, if what I say uh, does not come across. So what this technology allows you to do is something that, that some of our colleagues and other organisms have taken for granted for a long time. I would say particularly people who have studied unicellular organisms, such as yeast or bacteria. And that is to do what they call a genetic screen. And, and this may not mean much to you, but this basically means to interrogate every single gene in the genome of that organism for a particular function. This has been rather routine, again, in yeast and in bacteria. And incidentally, the, really, the, the use of yeast for that application was pioneered by our, our founding, uh, one of our founding members, Jerry Fink, uh, who, who I don't think was mentioned here today, but I'm sure has participated in the past. This has actually been routine in these organisms, but it actually has not been routine in most mammalian systems, and particularly in human cells. This has not been something we've been able to do. And the CRISPR technology allows us to do this now, and it allows us to do it for every single gene in a very precise way, knowing that we're just targeting a gene, 
and it allows us to do it for all genes, and moreover, it allows us to do it for all genes at the same time. Okay. And so that means that we can now take, as Rick alluded to, any type of cancer and come up with the parts list of the genes that that cancer cares about. And the reason that matters is that once we have that list, we can presumably understand something about what those genes do and the protein that those genes encode. Remember, you know, DNA to RNA to protein, so ultimately we would study the protein and make inhibitors to that protein and hopefully be able to specifically target that type of cancer. Because one of the things that comes out from getting the parts list for a type of cancer is that we can identify the genes that matter to that cancer but not to normal cells. That's part of the key criteria here, is to say your, this cancer cares but that other cancer doesn't care, and more importantly, normal cells do not care of that. So I'm gonna tell you how this technology came about and then give you some examples of some of the data that we've started to acquire with it. And this is an interesting story because it goes back to what Hazel was talking about, the power of, of basic research, but it also has a connection from industry, and actually you could call sort of the, the dairy industry had an important role here. But the, even, even in, in industry, it was really basic science research that led to the key insights. The story does start with something that many of you may have eaten today, that is yogurt, um, which is shown uh, here. And I think all of you know that yogurt is a product made by bacteria by the fermentation, typically, of, of milk, right? And they, they, uh, they, they, they eat sort of the sugars in the milk, make lactic acid, and that's what makes the proteins denature and gives yogurt that sort of kind of creamy uh, texture. A lot of yogurt is quite popular now, a lot of production of it across the world. And you may not realize this, but, but the guys who make yogurt have a big issue. And that is that sometimes their bacteria, which are shown here, get infected, just the same way that we might get infected. And they get infected with a virus. And in the case of bacteria, we don't call the viruses that infect them viruses, we actually call them phage. And, and these are some of the first sort of I guess you don't, you're not organisms, but biological entities that were studied to really understand some of the, the basic uh, principles of biology. A lot of it came from the study of phage, and incidentally, some of it uh, at MIT. And this is what these, these things look like. Here's a aphage, and they're, they're really quite cool looking. This is what they look like more in real life, attacking a bacterium here. And they basically land on the surface of the bacteria, and they inject their DNA, their genome, into the bacterium. And this DNA, once it gets into the bacteria, basically reprograms that bacteria from doing whatever it was doing, which in, in this case was making yogurt, to basically making phage. And the bacteria fills with these phage particles, these virus-like particles, and basically explodes and releases more of them. So this turns out to be a major issue in the yogurt industry, where they'll have their favorite sort of isolated bacteria all of a sudden gets wiped out by a phage infection. And so as you might imagine, uh, the, the yoga industry was very interested in, in trying to combat this and trying to understand uh, if there was ways that you could deal with this. And what they noted was that, that some bacteria were resistant. So there would be a phage infection, but some bacteria would emerge that were resistant to that phage and that they could then use to, to make yogurt. And so the question became why? Right? Why would some bacteria become resistant? And this led to a very unexpected discovery. And, and the truth is, it, this is something that probably could not have been done until relatively recently, because the way they went about this is they simply sequenced the entire genome of the bacteria um, before being resistant and then becoming, after becoming resistant. And this is not so hard to do now. With the, the new technologies that there is for genome sequencing, sequencing a bacterial genome is actually relatively easy. They're probably several orders of magnitude smaller than our genome, so relatively easy uh, to do. And so now they had these two genomes, before and after, becoming resistant to, to phage. And they simply said, what's different? Right? You have all this massive sequence, millions of, of, of base pairs of, of, of nucleotides that were sequenced. They said, what's different? And they only found one thing that was different, which at first was odd, and it was not so easy to understand what that was. And I'm showing it to you here. And, and what this is, this is a, a zoom in to the bacterial genome showing the thing that was different. And this is what it was right here. This little sequence this is a cartoon of that sequence. And the first thing they noted were these, what are, are depicted here are these sort of triangles sort of uh, uh, pointing out uh, from each other. And these were palindromic sequences. And in fact, that's what gives CRISPR the P here. This is a palindromic repeat. 
But the really interesting part was actually not these palindromes, but were these little white boxes, you can see are numbered from 1 to, to 32, that were right between these little palindromes. And at first they didn't know what these were. They knew that they weren't in other bacteria. And then they realized that these were actually parts of the phage genome. Little snippets of around 20 nucleotides that the bacterium had stolen from the phage. So they could map it back onto the phage genome. And so what seemed to have happened was that when that, that phage went in, it got chopped up into little pieces, and then the bacterium stole them and injected it into its own genome. Right? There, there's no process like that that happens for us, where we sort of steal, at least that we know of, that we steal parts of a, not an organism again, but another, a biological entity and stick it into our genome. But the bacterium had done this. And these investigators were actually were at a Danish uh, yogurt company, which was eventually, a big agriculture, was eventually bought by DuPont partly because of the patents that they got around here. Um, they, they immediately realized, although they didn't know the mechanism, that the bacterium was probably using this information to battle new phage. So if it managed to survive that initial infection, it now became resistant because it acquired these little sequences that somehow it could fight new infections. So the big question became how. It's clear that this must be important, but how did this actually happen? And this involved many researchers in, in many, many different disciplines uh, really across the world, mostly on the academic side. And the answer was, was incredibly simple and very elegant. And that is that there was an enzyme. There's, in fact, many of these kinds of enzymes. The, the most famous is the one I'm showing here is called Cas9. And it, gave, it was given this name because it was actually very near where these repeats were in the genome. And what this enzyme does is it takes that little phage piece after it's been converted from DNA to RNA, again, the, the central dogma of biology, DNA to RNA to, to protein. In this case, that little RNA binds to this enzyme called Cas9, and now that complex of, of the enzyme, a protein, with that little RNA basically becomes sort of like a loaded gun, and it, and it hunts for pieces of DNA that are complementary. That is, it can match to that little RNA sequence. And when it finds them, it cuts them and destroys them. So it became very clear how a bacterium that would have this little sequence could target phage, because as soon as that phage would inject its DNA, it would get destroyed by this little machine here. So this was obviously very important for, for, uh, for, for bacterial biology, and this was thought to be sort of a primitive immune system that bacteria had, sort of an innate, or sorry, an adaptive type of immune system. But the real breakthrough came when it was realized that you could program this system, not with little pieces of phage, but pretty much with any sequence you wanted. And that would make this enzyme now go target whatever sequence you wanted in any organism, including ours, and cut whatever was there. And if it was a gene, it would kill that gene. So all of a sudden, we had a method that was programmable simply by the sequence of this so-called guide RNA, or small guide RNA, sgRNA, simply by telling it this enzyme, that sequence, we could destroy any piece of DNA we wanted in any organism that we wanted. So this is an amazingly powerful thing, really unprecedented, that one could program simply with this information, just computationally, that little sequence, kill any gene you want. And in fact, this has been now done in many organisms, and Rudy Yanish at the Whitehead has really pioneered using this to target the mouse you know. The approach we've taken is a little bit different, and that is that we haven't tried to go after gene by gene, but we've wanted to do all the genes at once to try to get something that was sort of genetic-like. Uh, and we have about 20,000 genes, and so we've made what we would call a library against all the genes, and for every gene, we make 10 of these, and so 20,000 by 10 gives us 200,000. So with 200,000 of these, one has it's actually quite overkill. You can target all human genes. And th this seems like a large number, but, but it's not really an enormous n number nowadays. So we have in one tube 200,000 of these, and we can monitor them quite easily with, with, uh, with, with new sequencing technologies. And what we do is we put these into a different kind of virus. We, in fact, put it into an HIV-like virus. Okay? And this now allows us to put these little guides to any cell we want. And so the experiment that you can imagine, and this is really, to some extent, a thought experiment, although it's, it's ongoing, is that you take this library, again, you target all human genes, and now you put it into different cancer cells. 
Okay, and these are cells that are derived from real human tumors. So when the tumor is taken out of a person, it's put in culture, and if you're fortunate, and, and increasingly people are quite fortunate to be able to do this, you can grow cancer cells out of this. And so the thought experiment you can do is now put this library into cancer cell one, two, three, and this then number goes up to thousands of cancer cells. And for each cancer cell, for every single gene, decide whether that gene matters to that cancer cell or it doesn't matter. And moreover, it's not a binary decision. You actually can say how much it matters. You get a quantitative score for every single gene in every single cell of ideally all those cancers that Rick showed you uh, there, the, the untreatable cancers. And if you were able to do that, you would now identify for every single kind of cancer genes whose products were essential and that theoretically then would be good targets to make drugs to. And this has been impossible to do before. Everything that's been done in cancer before has really been based on a hypothesis and then following that idea sort of in a logical path. This is completely unbiased. All you're saying is cancer, tell me what you care about. I have no, no sort of preconceived notions as to what that is. And so we started to do this, and I have to say it's been amazing. You, are, you find, of course, some of the expected things, but the more interesting things you find are the completely unexpected things that could lead to new, new therapies, ideally. So I'm gonna give you one example from one type of cancer. And this is a cancer that actually not, was, was not on Rick's list. It's called acute myeloid leukemia, or, or AML. And this is the most common type of leukemia in the US. It's around 15,000 cases per year. And this is quite heterogeneous. Some AML cases are quite well cured. Others are not cured at all, and people die of these. And we actually know which types of AML tend to be worse than other types of AMLs. In fact, they're defined by certain genetic uh, lesions. Now, one thing you could say was, well, why not just decide what the cancer cares, cares about by sequencing its genome and finding the mutations in it and saying, okay, well, if the cancer has that mutation, they must care about that. And of course, there are people who are trying to do this. One reason is that cancer requires lots of mutations, so-called passenger mutations that don't seem to matter, it's just the cancer doesn't really care about carrying a high mutational load. But the other is that even if you just hone in on the mutations that you think might matter, it's actually very complicated. Probably many of you have not seen this kind of diagram. This is called a circus plot. And what this shows is each of these is a gene that's mutated in AML. And the, the, the size of this arc of this circle represents individual patients that are carrying that mutation. And then these lines connect up to other mutations that they carry. And you can see that this is amazingly complicated. That if you have, for example, a mutation in this, you might have mutations in this one, but in that one, in that one. And so there's an incredible diversity of mutations that these types of cancers are, are carrying. And so going from this information to saying this is the gene that matters is pretty much impossible. And this has now been appreciated to be a major challenge in, in cancer biology. So let me show you how we're going about, going about uh, this. Can one use this kind of information plus this CRISPR technology to get at what actually cancers care about? And I would say there's, there's really two classes of genes that we want to know about. One class is the classic oncogene that I think uh, Hazel mentioned before. And as you probably know, these are the genes that when they're mutated, make a normal cell into a cancer cell. Okay, and there's many famous ones of those. And some people call these oncogenic drivers. So we'd like to know for any type of cancer, what's the oncogenic driver. But then there's a, a second class of gene, which is a little bit sort of the holy grail of cancer. And these are, these are called the synthetic lethal genes, and I'll show you an example of this. And these are genes 